piece uh, is called War Stories, and um, I did this uh, as part of the Atelier. It was the first piece I did at Self Help Graphics, which of course meant that I had a tremendous amount of um, pressure. Um, uh, you know, I spoke about that a little bit because it was I never had um, done this kind of, of work before, and um, I was just, uh, you know. I thought, oh my god, if I mess this up, they'll never have me can do anything there again. I was just completely, you know, I just had so much pressure. Um, but it was right after the uh, first Gulf War started, and my cousin was there. And, you know, here's, he's, my cousin was somebody who um, basically was in the military, not because he was just, a, you know, into, you know, had some, you know, grandiose ideas about, America, but you know, for a lot of people, it's you know, you can get a, a college education, you know, the GI Bill, you know, they do it for that. And so, um, he was in the military because you know, he wanted to get money for college, and then the next thing he knows, he finds himself in the middle of a war. And um, so, it just got me thinking a lot about you know, the history of like how people end up in wars. And uh, about my own family, and, and again, uh, I was, you know, reconnecting with my history and the history of my family. And uh, so this made me think about my Uncle Bud. So I decided to do this piece, and, and again, um, I had, at the time I was using a lot of text in my work, and um, I, I really have used a lot of text throughout, you know, all my work. And um, uh, I like to tell stories, or I, I, you know, especially at this point in time, I was telling a lot of stories. And um, I liked the idea of some of things not being what they appear to be. Um, so uh, I wanted to do a piece that appeared as being very decorative um, and not really having a lot particularly going on. And then you would get into it and sort of read it and understand it, and it would be uh, very different. Than, than what was really, you know, what you might initially see in the piece. And so I think of this piece as, um, as sort of like, it, as if you were to tear it off the fabric of stories of a million people's stories, like these are their stories. But it even, you know, I'll, I'll read the text, but um, it, it breaks off like halfway in the middle of a sentence because it's this idea of it's like torn off the wall of stories. Um, so what I have here is around the outside, this is the story of my uncle, uh, or my uncle um, Bud. And it goes, uh, my uncle grew up in the barrios of Los Angeles in the 40s and 50s. In his eyes, both socially and economically, college and a white collar career were not a viable life choice. In 1957, joining his neighborhood gang, seemed natural to him. He became part of Little Valley and Lincoln Heights. Because of his unusual coloring, a Mexican with red hair, he was known as Red. This trait also made him easily identified. In 1958, he was implicated in a shooting in El Cerrano. The judge in the case gave him the choice of jail time or the military. Enlisting in the military seemed the obvious choice. In 1965, he was sent to Vietnam. Six months later, he was shot in the head. In the 80s, his name was inscribed in the Vietnam War Memorial in Washington, D.C. His younger brother also grew up in the same environment. He wanted to be the first person in the family to go to college. The only way he could go see this as an economic and then that's where it breaks off. So this is sort of the Vietnam and it talks about the fact that my uncle ended up in Vietnam because it was that or jail. And the fact was at the time there was a lot of guys who ended up in Vietnam. That's, they did that regularly as a choice and he ended up, you know, dying. So, you know, that, that, that I was thinking about that and then in the middle, um, was this piece about my cousin um, in the Gulf War. And so then um, that his story goes in 1987 amid promises of job training and future money for college, my cousin joined the military. 
in the 90s, he found himself stationed in the Middle East in the Gulf War. So it's just, you know, two stories out of many. Uh, uh, so that's what this, this piece is about. And, uh, okay, and um, there's a second piece. Yeah. So this second piece was part of a uh, atelier that I did, um, which was women, and we were working with Sorwana. Mm -hmm. uh, so the whole, everyone did pieces about Sorwana. Uh, and uh, so, uh, you know, her story is, you know, she was this amazing intellect and, and educated woman in Mexico, and a nun. And um, she really, um, she, there was no way for her to be educated unless she was a nun. And um, she was very much a feminist thinker. She was far ahead of her time. I mean, far ahead. And um, she wrote all, all these amazing things. I mean, really, some of her writing, if you were to read it now, you would think it was from this 1970s women's movement. And here it was, you know, um, a couple hundred years ago. Um, but, you know, in a way, so I, I, I thought about, like, this woman who had this amazing... Uh, so anyway, she wrote this, this series of, of things, and then at a certain point, you know, she was very critical of the church, and she was critical of politics, and she was a nun, and, and so they, they basically, you know, shunted her away, and she couldn't have her work published anymore because she had been a published writer, and, you know, she did all this amazing thing. And so she basically was kind of, you know, just, and towards the end of her life, she just was almost, you know, ec you know just imprisoned, not, not literally, but just, you know, she was silenced in a way, you know, this amazing intellect. And so, um, I did this, so this piece is really about her, it's like a little kind of memorial thing to her, her and she's like here on this, this uh, roses, and you know, at the church, the rosary, although there's this dagger, it's really sharp, so double-edged sword, it's a little dab at the church. <laughs> and then I made like this, you know, as part of this altar, would be like where her photo would be, except there's this, this image of a brain. <laughs> <laughs> and it's behind bars, but the bars are like the, the thorns of a, of a rose. So it's this idea, you know, like, you know, it's like pretty, but it's, you know, they, you'll be pricked and, you know, this whole like of <laughs> roses thing going on. Um, so again, I mean, it's almost like, you know, like if this was an installation piece, I would have had like, you know, real branches or, you know, like, it's sort of, sort of like just break playing with, with uh, sim the symbology of things and um, um, I also have text in this where I, I uh, just quoted one of her um, uh, writings and it says, a liberty itself for me is no boon, if I hold it at such, it will soon be my bane, no more worries for me over boon so uncertain. I will own my own very soul as if it were not mine. Anyway, so the piece is called The Trappings of Sorwana. Wow. So, um, sort of double meaning in that. 